In this module, we will uh, look at the solutions of the revision paper, the second revision paper. I hope you have been uh, able to solve these. These are actually the questions are all related to whatever we have done in the course and so we will just go over it quickly. Uh, the first question is comment on whether the following goods, services, bads are rival, non-rival, excludable, non-excludable, public, private. Explain your answer. And so we will start with the first one, a biogas plant. So when you look at a biogas plant, a biogas plant is manufactured by a company, it is supplied it is sold at a price and uh, if someone uses the plant, it will not be available to someone else. So basically, this is very clearly, this is going to be rival as well as excludable. It is sold only once a price has been paid and so this is very clearly this is a private good. Let us look at the next one, the Eastern Freeway. The Eastern Freeway is a road in the city of Mumbai connecting the suburbs to the uh, main hub, then going all the way up to CST, and uh, this is a this is a freeway. There is no toll being charged. So, in the sense, if now in this case, in the case of a road, if there are if there are many p many cars coming on it, there would be congestion. So, if we avoid if we say that there is no congestion then this can be, this will be non-rival. Someone using the freeway does not affect the ability of someone else to use the freeway. If you think of congestion, then it could be rival. And since it is being made free, we are not, it's non-excludable. And this can be treated as a public good. We could change the rules and uh, if we have toll, then it is excludable. If uh, we are looking at congestion, then it could also be rival. But in this case, we can consider it as a public good. C is urban air pollution. This is a big problem in most cities in, the, in India now. And if we look at this, in a sense, um, someone's breathing the polluted air does not affect someone else's ability to breathe that polluted air. So essentially this is non-rival and generally this is also going to be non-excludable. Of course now people are putting air purifiers and looking at ways in which one can actually remove this, so that could change. So this is what is a public bad. And that is why since it is a public bad, uh, the normal rules of market are not very good at um, controlling this and then we need to have regulation, we need to have different kinds of methods. Now let us look at the last one here, this is cable television. In cable television, uh, this is actually going to be non-rival. And uh, in general, if, again, if depending on the bandwidth, if it's in, there is no congestion, your watching cable television does not affect someone else's ability to watch it. And uh, you have these set-top boxes. So only if you pay the charge, you are going to be able to get 
the channel, so it is excludable and this is a private good though it is non-rival. So, with this we look at it, so you can just summarize whatever we have done in the uh, course related to private goods and public goods and these examples illustrate this. So, let us move forward with the next part of the question 1 e and this question says IIT is charged 2 lakhs per year as annual fees to students for undergraduate education while the full cost of IIT education is about 6 lakhs per year. It may be a little more than that, but for the point of view of this question, we just put it as 6 lakhs per year. There is a proposal to recover the full cost of IIT education from the undergraduate students. Consider a society with 1 percent families containing IIT students. Would the proposal pass the Pareto condition? So, the currently the students are paying 2 lakhs and the increase in fees would be 6 lakhs. So, if we look at a Pareto condition, the uh, percentage of families, the families who are uh, with students who are uh, currently doing the education, they would not be there, they would not, their condition, their utility would decrease because they would have to pay an additional amount. So, it will clearly not pass the Pareto condition. Others would not be affected, but if we increase this, the existing students would, their utility would decrease and hence that would not pass the Pareto. Then the second thing is, uh, would it be based on the Pareto compensation principle? Now, the compensation principle uh, would not uh, be uh, would not uh, um, apply in this case because possibly the, with this additional money which is coming in, uh, maybe the uh, rest of the society will have to pay less. But then they, there is no way in which they can compensate or provide the uh, one percent of students with uh, the difference in this amount. So it will not pass. A compensation principle either, not pass the compensation test. Now, suppose the next part of the question is if the society has to pay an equal tax to bear the cost or recover the full cost from the students. So, these are the two options. So, clearly 99 percent of the population who would not want to, even though the amount would be less, uh, they would not want an increase in that in the taxes for education. The 1 percent would of course, say that an equal tax can bear the cost. Uh, so, from a voting point of view, the, the solution would, we will get an option where an equal tax to bear the cost will lose and the full cost would be borne from the students because it is only 1 percent. Um, now, the last part of the question is provide an economic argument justifying continuing the subsidized fee. So, if we look at higher education typically as a public good and if we look at the products of that education resulting in an enhanced income for society and every graduate from the IITs based on the income that they are going to earn over the over their lifetime and their career and uh, and the taxes that they pay to the government. So, from an economic viewpoint, the enhanced ability to earn will compensate for the uh, subsidized fee. The second thing is that in, in general, uh, we can, they will be also thinking in terms of creating new knowledge and providing an opportunity 
for all. So that means every individual has this opportunity and depending on the, their abilities they can get through this and then they can upgrade their, uh, uh, upgrade their abilities and then they can contribute to society. And in many cases the e graduates would actually also create employment and create. This of course is a debatable issue but in many cases you will see that uh, a lot of literature talks about higher education actually being uh, a public good and this is something which benefits society in the long run. Uh, so the other option of course is to provide loans uh, but depending on the average income uh, taking uh, a large amount of loan for education uh, becomes a barrier for several um, families and this has an equity impact. Let's move ahead to the second question. The second question is a uh, standard supply demand curve which we have, uh, we had also solved it in the, uh, when we had done that module. If you look at this, this is a supply curve for coal in a country is given as P is equal to 2500 plus 5Q. Demand curve is given as 8500 minus 10Q where P is the price in rupees per ton, Q is the quantity in appropriate units say million tons annually. Plot the supply and demand curves, determine the equilibrium price and quantity. What is the consumer surplus and producer surplus? Show these on the plot. What is an externality? In the case of coal production, list some of the externalities. If the government decides to impose a carbon tax on all the coal sold, that means 500 rupees per ton of coal, show the new equilibrium point. Is the tax efficient? Does it result in a change in the total surplus? What could be the justification for the carbon tax? So let's start with the first thing is that let's, let's draw the quantity on the x-axis and price on the y-axis <coughs> and if we look at this and uh, the sub demand curve will be given as let's take this is d d this is 8500 minus 10 q and so this is 8500 and the supply curve is, so let's say somewhere here, 2500, 2500 plus 5Q. This is the point of intersection. This is the equilibrium quantity equilibrium price and these points, this is the consumer surplus because this is the price paid is P0 but at zero quantity the demand we are willing to pay so much so this is the consumer surplus and this one is the producer surplus. This is consumer surplus, producer surplus. This is the total surplus. So this is what we have done. Uh, we can calculate this. Let us just calculate from the equation. Uh, Let us put down 2500 plus 5Q is equal to 8500 minus 10Q. So we get 15Q is equal to 6000Q is equal to um, 6000 by 15. 400 units, let us say million tons or so. What is the price? Price is going to be 2500 
plus 5 into 4400 sorry and this comes to 4500 rupees per ton. So, we can go back to this and write down this is 4500 and this one is 400. Yeah, this is 850. Okay. Uh, so, now we have done this, show these on the plot. What is an externality? An externality is basically something which come influences and the utility of a consumer or the um, production function of a producer without its own permission. Um, so, in the case of coal production, what are the uh, externalities that we have? Well, we have um, the in the mining, there would be a lot of dust and there would be a lot of land uh, modification and there in the case of uh, there would be also pollution in terms of uh, the both air quality as well as water and so these are the kind of things. And then the use of coal when we look at it we will have carbon dioxide and we have you know, emissions. Uh, so, these are some of the externalities and if the government decides to impose a carbon tax on all the coal sold and uh, incidentally there is already a carbon cess today and it is probably around 400 rupees per ton. Um, they said, so, we have said here suppose there, uh, there is a carbon tax of 500 rupees per ton, how would the uh, equilibrium change? and is the tax efficient. So, what this would mean is that if you look at the supply curve for every ton we are adding another 500. So, this will now start from 3000 and we would have it as a something which would be should be parallel to this. So, now this will be the new point, new point is q dash and p dash. We can calculate this, let us calculate it by looking at how much will this be. Uh, we can three thousand now plus five q is eight thousand five hundred minus ten q. So, fifteen q is 5500 q is 5500 by 15 367 million tons so what has happened is we have now the equilibrium point has shifted and we are now re using less amount of coal and the price now is 3000 plus 5 into 1100 by 3, which comes out to be 4833 rupees per ton. So, now we have shifted from the earlier case where we had the uh, price of the initial equilibrium point was 4000, uh, sorry, 400 million tons and 4500 and this has shifted to 367 million tons and 4833. So, if we go back to the figure that we had, this is 367, this is 483. 
V 3. Now, if you look at the total surplus, you will see that the total surplus has decreased. Total surplus has decreased. So, the tax of cost is not efficient from that point because the total surplus has decreased from an economic viewpoint. However, the justification is that if we look at the cost of carbon and the social cost of carbon and incorporate that, then you will find that overall there is a benefit because we are reducing the CO2 and then uh, the benefit to society offsets the loss which is there uh, for the consumers and the producers. And so, the justification for the carbon tax is that we would like to see that we use uh, we use, we reduce the total CO2 emissions and then we are trying to give a disincentive for using uh, coal uh, which has a high carbon content. So, this is, this was the uh, calculation for the second problem. Uh, now, let us move on to the next problem. <coughs> so, the here we are looking at Consider a decision being taken in your hostel um, so that we can uh, invest in a flower garden between two wings. Now, the way this works is that the hostel has a large number of 300 uh, residents out of which 100 residents are willing to pay a little more. They have a marginal willingness to pay by P is equal to 100 minus 2 Q because they can have a direct view of the garden while the other residents can if they are passing by will see it, but they do not have it from their room. So, the 200 residents have a marginal willingness to pay which is less 60 minus 3 Q where Q is the number of flowering plants and P is the willingness to pay in rupees. Marginal cost of supply of a flowering plant is constant at 150 rupees. So, at 150 rupees you can buy one plant and then put it in the garden. So, the question is how many plants should be put in the garden. So, we want to sketch the aggregate demand and supply curves and determine the optimal number of flowering plants. And then we the question further asks is this a Lindahl equilibrium? Is this feasible to implement? What are the difficulties in implementing the Lindahl equilibrium? So, now, this is a public good and uh, the supply though is something where there is a price for the supply, but uh, the good of having a garden is something which is non-excludable and it is a, a private good. But uh, the question is how much of that public good uh, should we be providing and uh, when we look at this, if we try to sketch this. If we look at the marginal willingness to pay and P and the quantity Q, you will see that individual, the individual uh, who are have a direct view of the um, garden have a um, marginal willingness to pay P is 100 minus 2q. So, this will go on to when it becomes 0 beyond. So, that will be 50. So, we can just join this. This is the individual demand curve and there are 100 such individuals. For the other set, those who are not having a direct view of the, it will start from 60. P is equal to 60 minus 3 Q. So, it will go on till 20. And here N 2 is equal to 60. The demand, the, the supply the uh, uh, curve will be shown clearly as a straight line at 150. Now, here what happens is that we aggregate 
based on the number of potted plants which are there at any value of Q, we can find out how much people are willing to pay from these two curves. So, when it is between 0 and 20, you will have a, sorry, the N2 is equal to 200. So, these 200 people will be willing to pay from here and 100 people. So, we can take any point here and just take the values which will be here and multiply. So, we will get if it is at if 0, let us just write this as if 0 less than q less than equal to 20, what will happen is the total willingness to pay aggregate demand curve P will be 100 into 100 minus 2q plus 200 into 60 minus 3q. So, this is 1000, 10,000 minus 200q plus e 12,000 minus 600 Q equal to 22,000, 10,000 plus 22,000 minus 800 Q. So, if we look at this, this is the total amount that we are willing to pay. This is going on uh, from, uh, so it will start from 22,000 and then uh, come down when it Q is equal to 20, this will be P will be 22,000 minus uh, 860. So, this is going to be 6000. <coughs> so, what will happen here is that when we do this curve, the aggregate curve P, we start from 22000 and then we go to when we take 20, let us take 50. In the case of this, 22, 10, 6, let's say 6,000. This is the aggregate demand curve. From here onwards, from 20 to the next point, it is only going to be equal to P is equal to 100 into 100 minus 2 Q because all those the remaining uh, the this set of individuals are not willing to pay anything beyond 20. So, it is only going to be this. So, when we look at this, this is going to be equal to 10,000 minus 200 Q. Now, if the the supply price here is 150. So, if we put this as 150, <coughs> then this is going to be equal to 9850 is equal to 200 Q nine eight five zero by 200. So, we round it off to the smallest whole number which comes to about 49. So, this we have a line here 
which is the demand curve which is 150 and at around this we go to this actually it will intersect the it will intersect almost at this point so th this is uh, if you draw it um, proportionately you will find that this is the value which is there uh, so this is uh, now the question which has been asked is is this a lindahl equilibrium yes it is a lindahl equilibrium because we are asking individuals uh, what is their willingness to pay and then we are aggregating that. Uh, is this feasible to implement? It is difficult to implement. One is because there is, it is difficult to get uh, the demand curves of the individuals, uh, stated demand curves accurately. Uh, there is an incentive um, to understate the willingness to pay because you enjoy the, uh, the quality but you will pay based on your based on the uh, marginal willingness to pay so others may get a better share so basically the issue is the difficulties in implementing the lindahl equilibrium is the ability to uh, assess uh, the uh, individual demand curves and the point that there is an incentive for individuals to understate their willingness to pay so that they actually uh, end up uh, not paying this. But uh, theoretically, the Lindahl equilibrium is an interesting concept and uh, there is this whole issue in terms of uh, when we try to price a public good or a public bad, uh, this, these are the kind of problem. So this is what we have uh, solved in this question.